We're going to talk today about Murphy's Law and the Christian. We all know Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong, will go wrong, and at the worst possible time. Now, as I was reading, actually, you know, I was preparing for this, and I was preparing for this, I read that there's an engineering school who actually incorporates this in their curriculum. And what they say is, since we know Murphy's Law, we need to make sure that we look at our projects from every possible angle and try to prepare for anything that can go wrong. Sounds good, but Murphy has a corollary to that. If you perceive that there are four possible ways in which a procedure can go wrong and you circumvent these, then a fifth way, unprepared for, will promptly develop. <laughs> it sure seems that way sometimes, doesn't it? Or as somebody said, if anything can't go wrong on its own, someone will make it go wrong. And there are other corollaries to Murphy's Law. Nothing is as easy as it looks. If you've ever watched the home renovation show, you know that's true. If one thing goes wrong, everything else will, and at the same time. Once a job is botched, any attempts to fix it will make it worse. And then more practically, bread always falls buttered side down. <laughs> and if you drop something, it will be damaged in direct proportion to its value. And then my favorite, Murphy was an optimist. <laughs> but I'm going to add another one. Christians are not exempt from Murphy's Law. In fact, we're promised <laughs> that we'll experience it. You will experience pain and suffering and testing and trials as long as you are in this world. And it will increase the longer you are in this world. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. So let me just quickly review. When we were in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, talking about believing the Bible, you can find that uh, on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook page, wherever it is that you find our sermons, you can find the one that talks about believing the Bible, 1st century or 21st century. And we talked about verse 14, where Paul says, you suffered the same things the other churches did. And we talked about how believers are promised opposition. Jesus says, John 16, in this world, you will have trouble. In Mark chapter 13, verse 13, he says, in the last days, everyone will hate you because of me. And Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, here in the third verse of the third chapter, he's talked about trials, and he says, you know we are destined for them. Have you been paying attention over the last couple of weeks to the hatred and the vitriol aimed at people who believe, Psalm 139, you know, who believe what the Bible speaks on the issues of the day? And Paul is basically reminding them and us that we are unique in our suffering. And when we're going through difficult times, it's helpful to remember. It sounds cruel, but it's necessary to remember we're not the first to suffer for our faith, and we're not the only ones to suffer for our faith. And as the Hebrew writer reminded them in chapter 12, verse 4, you haven't suffered to the point of shedding your blood. So, you know, there is some perspective that we need. None of us yet, you know, have, have lost our heads because of our faith. And we mentioned a couple of weeks ago that sometimes the opposition comes from your own people. That's when it really gets hard. It's one thing if people outside your family, outside your circle, outside of the Christian faith attack you, you kind of expect that. But when it's your own people, and they don't understand you, and they begin to oppose you, that's a different level. And the truth is that believing the Bible and living for Christ is going to bring opposition. And Satan is always behind it. In verse 18 of chapter 2, Paul says, We wanted to come to see you, but Satan stopped us. Now, it's important for us to remember 
that Satan is not the direct cause of all of the problems in your life. Don't blame everything on the devil. Sometimes you run out of gasoline because you didn't pay attention to the low fuel light. Or you decided, this is the time I'm going to see how far I can go when it says I've got low fuel. Don't blame that on the devil. Don't blame that on God. Sometimes you wake up sick in the middle of the night because you had three pieces of cake as your bedtime snack. Don't blame the devil for that. Don't blame God for that. However, do understand that any time we go through challenging times, the devil is looking for ways to use it to sidetrack us. Don't be surprised when pain and suffering come. Second thing I want to say about this is that pain and suffering can unsettle you. Verse 3, Paul uses a couple of interesting words. He uses the word unsettled and he uses the word trials. They're interesting words. The word unsettled literally means to wag the tail. And it's a picture of a little puppy. Have you ever seen a little puppy so excited? They're wagging their tail back and forth so vigorously that they're losing their balance. You know, and, and they're kind of trying to stay up while they're wagging their tail. That's the picture here. Paul says trials can shake you so hard that you lose your balance. And that's sure true, isn't it? You think about how difficult it is to maintain your faith, maintain your balance, maintain a good spirit in the midst of difficult times in life. And the word trial comes from a word that means under the thumb. Now we used to use that expression, they're just under their thumb. And it meant that pressure from above. Anybody living with unrelenting pressure? You just feel like you're under its thumb. It might be a chronic health situation. It might be living in chronic pain. It might be the, the effect of long COVID. It might be the, the financial pressure because of bad decisions you made, or maybe just because of what the economy's done in the last couple of years. Maybe it's a relationship that it doesn't seem that no matter what you try, it doesn't get better. Maybe it's the unrelenting pressure of being under the thumb of a boss and you've got to have that job to make ends meet. I think most of us know what it's like to feel under the thumb of trials and pressure that are shaking us. We're trying to keep our balance. And Paul says, I know that's how trials can make you feel, that you're being shaken, that you're coming unglued. And he says, I wanted to make sure that the tempter had not tempted you, and our labors would therefore be in vain. And, and that word tempted there has with it the idea of deception. And I got thinking about that. The deception and temptation that we experience when we go through Murphy's Law. And, and it doesn't have to be we're being persecuted for our faith. It's just when you're having a bad day and things aren't going right and you can't seem to find an answer and you're in one of those cornfield mazes and you can't find your way out and you're tempted, I'm just going to walk through however I can get out of here. You know, those times of life, we face deception and temptation. And, and I was thinking about that and I, this doesn't come directly from the word. This, is, this comes from 40 plus ex years experience in ministry. I think that the deception that we most typically face when we go through Murphy's Law seasons is the deception of thinking God doesn't care about me anymore. God doesn't love me anymore. He doesn't hear my prayers anymore. He's not on my side anymore. And we get deceived and it's understandable. I mean, <laughs> how many times have I been at a bedside in a hospital or a long-term care facility and have to say to a family, 
I don't know either. I can't figure it out. I don't have an answer for you. I, I don't have an answer to that lady who asked me why my husband died of a health condition in his 50s and my mom, who is in her 90s and who is desperately praying to go to heaven, is still here. I don't know. But I understand that that opens you up to deception, right? I mean, that, that's just humanity to think, you know, well, God, are you really there? How many times have we said that the last two and a half years? God, are you really there? Are you really paying attention? Is this really what your will is for us? And that deception comes in. And then right on the heels of that deception, I think, is the temptation overwhelmingly just to quit. The temptation to say, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm throwing up my hands. God, as the Quaker said, God, I don't, I'm not surprised you have so few friends, seeing how you treat the ones you do have. You know? and, and we sometimes have that feeling of, well, God, if you're going to treat me like this, I'm just going to quit. Because I look around, and it seems that the heathen are doing great. And all us Christians who are trying to live for you are, are going through hassles. So Paul says to them, I had to send Timothy to you because I wanted to make sure that your trials have not unsettled you, that our labor has not been in vain, that you've not been deceived, that you've not quit. Because it is possible to grow through times of pain and suffering. In fact, that's God's plan for us, that we would grow during those times. When you're talking about tests and trials, there are three passages of Scripture you've got to look at whether you're preaching from them or not. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. Not only so, but we also glory or rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given us. And you have to look at James chapter 1, where James says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work. That's hard. We want to short circuit the process. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And if you can't figure it out, if you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. It's possible to grow during the Murphy's Law seasons of your life. 1 Peter chapter 4. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it shouldn't be as a murderer or a thief or other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. But if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Wow. <laughs> That's some heavy stuff. But it is possible to grow during the times of pain and suffering in our lives. The key is our attitude fed by our faith. In verse 6, he says, Timothy has come to us. He's brought us good news about your faith and love. He's told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we long to see you. That's the attitude. See, they could have been angry at Paul. They could have said, here we were in Thessalonica, we were doing fine as Jews, and then Paul comes around, and we convert to Christianity, and now we're going through all this suffering. But no, they had pleasant memories, and they longed to see Paul. That was their attitude. That attitude 
was fed by their faith because he says in verse 7, we were encouraged because of your faith. And in verse 8, he says, you're standing firm in the Lord. Our attitude is so very important when we're going through difficulties. What are you focused on? But the attitude is fed by our faith, standing firm in the Lord. You can't maintain a positive attitude for very long without faith. Our faith that God is sovereign, that he is in control, that he is great, that he is good, that he loves me, and he is working in everything for my good as I love him, that faith will fuel our attitude to be able to stay focused on the positive. Somebody put it this way, and it, it hit me hard when I read this sentence. When hard times come, be a student, not a victim. Yeah. Learn from them. Don't be a victim of them. Or as Paul says in verse 3, we were destined by them. Somebody said, when the hard times come, it's an appointment, not an accident. Man, that's a tough way to look at difficult times, isn't it? We'd rather look at it as an accident. Paul said, I mean, he said, we were destined for them. We knew they were coming. I told you they were coming. And now you see that I was telling you the truth. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to take a couple minutes here to talk about some things I hope will be helpful to you. It was helpful to me when, when I heard them earlier in my life. Because so many times when we're going through difficult times, we ask, why me? But the question is not, why me? The question really is, well, why not me? I mean, everybody else is going through suffering, trials. I might not know it. But what makes me think that I should be exempt from the tests and trials of life? I mean, it, it rains on the just and the unjust. I'm going to get wet some days. Why not? You know, I, I'm living on this earth. It's a sinful world. Why not me? And then not why me, but what can I learn? And whom can I help with what I'm learning? Now that'll change your perspective on the difficulties you're going through life. What can I learn? What is God teaching me through this? Pray harder. Be patient, you know, trust more, you know, stay away from those people. You know, what, what, it, what can I learn through this? And, and who can be helped by what I'm learning? I think we find as we look back over our lives that some of our most difficult times became the platform of some of our most powerful witness. That the things that we went through that we thought were going to kill us, but God brought us through them, are now part of our testimony and part of our witness and part of how we are able to help other people. But the question is, how do we maintain our faith to keep the right attitude when we're going through some pain and suffering? Well, first I want to suggest, find people who strengthen you and hang around them. In verse 2, Paul says, I sent Timothy to you to do two things, to strengthen you and to encourage you. To feed your faith and keep your attitude focused on God during the Murphy's Law seasons of your life. Find people who strengthen you and encourage you and hang around them. The word strengthen means what you would think it means, to make solid and firm. The second word to encourage is the word that Jesus used when he talk, called the Holy Spirit the comforter. It means to come alongside of somebody to help them. In other words, Timothy just wasn't up standing behind a pulpit lecturing you on how to stay strong in trials. He was here to walk with you through it. He was called alongside of you to help you, to walk with you through it. 
you are blessed if you have some Timothys in your life. Some people that when you're having a rough time, you can call and say, I need prayer. I need you to listen to me vent for a while. Um, I, you know, do you have time to go get a Diet Coke somewhere? You know, that, those people to strengthen you and encourage you, hang around them. I think probably it's time for each of us to audit our circle of friends and to make sure that the people we are allowing the closest to us are people to encourage us and strengthen us. Uh, John Gordon calls people energy vampires. You know, they just suck all the energy out of you. They suck all the positivity out of you. Try to stay away from them. Now, I know you work with some of them, and you can't stay away from them. But the ones that you have options, you know, audit your circle of friends, especially that close circle. And then secondly, not just find the people who strengthen and encourage you, but become aware of the faith of others. In verse 7, he says, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. So Paul is going through his own kind of suffering. He wants to be back in Thessalonica. He's stuck at Athens, and he can't get back there. And so he's suffering. I mean, you read this chapter, and, and his heart just comes through how much he wanted to be with those friends of his and he couldn't and he's going through his own despair because of that but when he hears about their faith it encourages him now what that means for you and me read the scriptures about how god has been faithful to people going through trials if you read read biographies of people of faith it's amazing when you read biographies of people of faith you will find that they had a life with a lot of trials and a lot of tests i remember you know earlier earlier in my ministry i did a lot of reading biographies of of preachers that were kind of lifted up to me as the heroes of of uh, preaching and you know charles spurgeon who's considered to this day the prince of preachers, writes about being so terribly depressed after a Sunday that he could not get off his couch for a week. Like, whoa. And then he talks about God's faithfulness. You know, he's the one who said, the things that I learned about God in the good times, I could fit on the head of a pin. The things I learned about God in the hard times would fill volumes in a library. And you read those things and say, huh, I guess I'm not all that unusual, you know. If he went through it and he got through it, you know, and, and, and you read those biographies of people of faith and you find out, oh, their life was not easy, far from it. But God was faithful to them and they stayed true to God and their example can motivate and encourage you. When you read Hebrews 11, and that might be a good place to start, the Hall of Fame of Faith. Don't just read Hebrews 11. Go back to the stories that are referenced in Hebrews 11 and see God says to Abram and Sarah, I know you old, old, old people, but about this time next year, you're going to have a child and read about the child being born. I mean, and, and see how God is true during difficult times. Feed your mind and your spirit with faith success stories. Lean on, access the faith of others. And third, hang on to faith. He says you're standing firm in the Lord. We have to reach a point in our walk with God where we decide if he's God or not. And if we're going to trust him, or not and if we're going to live for him or not and we need to make that decision and when the murphy's law days and weeks and months and years hit you hang on to that faith god i trust you i do not understand you and you do not owe me an explanation one would be nice but you don't owe it to me but i trust you and i'm going to hang on to you
we are promised some Murphy's Law seasons of life. But God wants us to grow through them. So a couple of closing questions. When you go through those times, who or what helps you the most? I hope you know the answer to that question, or I hope in a few seconds you could come up with the answer to that question, because you need to be able to access it when you need it. I really need to call him or her and see if they've got time for lunch, or at least they'll talk to me on the phone for a while, or I really need to pull up that sermon that really helped me that I heard so-and-so preach on YouTube one time, and I need to find that sermon and listen to it again because it was helpful. I really need to dig out that book that God used to really speak to me during that difficult time 20 years ago. I need to dig it out and read it again. Maybe I just need to sit on my back porch or find a place of quiet somewhere and just sit in the presence of God. Maybe I just need to crank up the praise music as loud as I can and just allow it to fill my spirit. Whatever it is that encourages you during difficult times, please know what it is. And please have it where you can access it without a lot of searching. <laughs> Because sometimes life hits you smack in the face. I remember, again, years, year, decades ago, I, um, there was a, a book club that would send you books, and if you didn't like them, you could send them back. And, and I ordered this set of sermons. But I was young, and I was desperate to try to get ideas anywhere I could. I ended up sending the series back because it was more money than we had at the time. But I remember, and I do not remember the sermon, I do not remember the preacher. I wish I did. I'd try to find it. But the title of the sermon arrested me. It was, But when life tumbles in, what then? Oh, yeah. You know, you're going along, you're married, but when life tumbles in, what then? Hopefully, you have some resources that you can access when life tumbles in. And then let me flip the coin. Who can you encourage who's going through hard times? People that you may know are having a challenging time. What can you do to encourage them? Just like if you'd like to be able to sit down and call somebody, maybe you should call them or send them a, a text or an email or, or send, you know, sit down and write a card. I got a handwritten card couple of days ago from my former department head at the hospital that I retired from. Really meant a lot that he took the time to sit down and handwrite a card. You know, just, just what is it that you can do to encourage somebody else? Because here's what you'll find. As you encourage other people in their difficulties, you encourage yourself because you, you reap what you sow. So I don't want to discourage you about trials. They're a fact of life. What I want to encourage you about is that God will help you grow through them to be stronger in your faith, to be more effective as you help others, and to be a witness for Him. Father, may it be so in our lives. It's a whole lot easier to preach about than it is to live. But Lord, I pray for those in this room today and for those who are watching or listening in the days to come. You know exactly what we need. And Lord, so many people are going through such difficult times right now. And we just lift one another up to you and pray for your strength, pray for your grace, pray for your wisdom. I pray, Lord, that we would feel your everlasting arms around us and that we would be able to rest in your strength, that we would allow your spirit to fill us and overflow us so that even in the midst of our difficult times, we can minister to others in their difficult times. May the beauty of Jesus be seen in us. And as people observe us, may their faith be strengthened as they see our faith being maintained even in difficult times. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May he make his face to shine on you and give you his peace now and evermore. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being here today. You're dismissed.